is a dead shot. Chapter 8. Cultural Disavowal of God. The Reality of God's Absence. The problem of authority is perennial, but the dissolution of authority is one of the main characteristics of this post-Christian age. Evidence today, not only by religious syncretism or theological relativism, this disillusion is an effect of the scientific humanism which is replacing the Christian tradition, as well as the fatal misconduct on the part of Christianity. The crisis of authority is another aspect of the leveling down which has taken place in Western culture. This crisis is relevant to our thesis because authority is a symbol of faith. Even when, at its worst, it becomes an objectivation of faith, it still intends not to compel but to impel men's allegiance to a common ideal or belief. It is the objective expression of an ultimate concern, whereby the individual proposes to unmask and counteract the aggrandizement to apotheosis of his other concerns. In doing so, the individual acknowledges the impossibility of unifying objective reality and subjective truth. Religious authority does not entail the eradication of personal autonomy for the sake of blind assent to a system of beliefs claiming the sanction of absolute or divine authority. But religious authority, when it is not surreptitiously construed as an external power endowed with the wisdom of presenting a unified and coherent view of life and the world, symbolizes a synthesis of subjective truth and objective reality. This does not mean a tertium quid resting on their objectified identification or their abstract unification. Through the symbol of authority, the individual dis disclaims absolute validity for his personal conviction, just as he refuses to surrender it to any external entity. If a failure of faith provokes a squandering of authority or its usurpation, too much authority does not necessarily signify a greater demonstration of faith. On the contrary, too much authority means not only hubris or self-aggrandizement, it also means a violation of the structures of faith and their usurpation. It threatens the equilibrium between subject and object, between faith and reality. It does not destroy but sublimates the former. What this age is suffering from primarily is not a crisis of authority, but a crisis of faith. Not that faith has slackened, it has been inflated. An inflationary faith typifies the crisis of this age. Faith is an attempt to reconcile subject and object, subjective truth and objective reality, the self and the world, without overwhelming either one of the terms. Faith is an attempt to reconcile the two dimensions of existence, personal and impersonal, internal and external, without unifying them. It attempts to define man in terms of a synthesis or as the locus of a polarity and a tension between the absolute and the relative, the universal and the particular, the world and the self. It means that man does not live by logical consistency. Authority is a symbol of the kind of self-understanding man reaches through faith. By contrast, what characterizes our so-called religious as well as irreligious contemporaries is their common quest for logical consistency. That, that constitutes today the most vital opposition to the Christian tradition, and it comes from science and humanism, although both were formally grounded in Christian tradition. The Christian Basis of Science and Humanism From a strictly Christian point of view, the supposed antagonism between religion and science is a false one, and in keeping with the classic fundamentals of the Western tradition, there cannot be any real antagonism between religion and science between the province of religious authority, properly conceived, and the province of scientific investigation. Religious zealots who distrust science show that, that they do not understand the nature of faith and the religious definition of man, let alone the nature of scientific detachment and objectivity. Neither do the, do the devotees of science show any clear understanding of the existential ambiguities confronting man, those ambiguities which, if it is the proper responsibility of religion to clarify, and which some think that science can and must dispel. There is no real conflict between the respective provinces of religion and science. Whenever conflict appears, it is between false conceptions of these provinces, between a scientific conception of religion and a religious conception of science. That religion and science need not antagonize each other is the point of Bacon's remark to the effect that science leads to the insight and visions of faith, but a mere veneer of science does not.
religion is to be blamed for a good deal of the animosity between science and itself. It often provoked science to rebellion. Christianity began to lose its authority, and ipso facto its relevance, as soon as it claimed to give a scientific account of man and the universe. And the thinly veiled dogmatism of the devotees of science is but a repercussion of the intransigence of Christianity in scientific matters. Like rationalism, scientific agnosticism is a natural child of Christianity. Even so, there is no opposition between religious truth and scientific truth, between the method of faith and the method of science. It is not the scientific achievements up to date which render the Christian faith inefficient. Here, as with authority, the worst dilemma of modern man stems from the fact that his whole life is spent in a search for consistency, for the principle of unification. It is a characteristic of the Christian view that man's experience lives on another level than that of logical consistency. When, in reacting against progressive dissolution of its authority, Christianity began to desire consistency, it disowned the very foundations of the scientific quest it had itself laid down. One of the significant aspects of classical Christianity and of Judaism is its understanding of the universe, of the world, or reality or nature, from the point of view of biblical thought, the universe is God's creation. Between these two realities, that of God and that of his creation, there is a concomitance which is so construed that God's reality cannot be deduced either by addition or subtraction from the reality of the creation. God's being is not the sum total of all beings, nor do other beings participate in the nature of God. And yet, biblical thought is audaciously anthropomorphic. It even pushes anthropomorphism to the extent that, Rudolf Bultmann points out, the divine is described in human terms while the human is appraised in divine terms. Yet God is never conceived as the ideal man, nor man as divine. When Adam wants to become like God, he falls. There is a boundary between God and man, as there is between the creator and the cr creature, or the creation. This boundary does not exclude the fact that God is man's God, that between them there is a fundamental concomitance, or reciprocity, or mutuality. Accordingly, God can dwell in man, but he is not human, and he can manifest his presence through his creation, be present in it, but never become part of it. The concept of God as the creator precludes both naturalism or spiritualism and mysticism or rationalism. All of these aim to provide man with a worldview which is primarily coherent, so coherent that God himself becomes a part of the universe which is to be explained. God thus becomes either the first cause or the deus ex machina. By contrast, the privilege of biblical thought is that in its presentation, the explanation of the universe and its relation to man only serves as a pointer to God, to that without which the explanation could never be constructed, although the explanation does not abrogate the actual inconsistencies of existence. What Reinhold Niebuhr says of the biblical myth applies to biblical thought in general. One of its fundamental distinctions consists in picturing the world as a realm of coherence and meaning without defying the fact of incoherence. Its world is coherent because all facts in it are related to some central source of meaning. But all facts are not immediately coherent and meaningful, because biblical thought does not aim at formulating a system of rational or naturalistic unity. God is neither the world's soul, nor the zenith of human non-rational introspection, just as he is not the absentee landlord referred to as the deus ex machina. But God stands over against man and confronts him, whether life is coherent or not, and whether destiny is woven with logical consistencies or not. Otherwise, man and his achievements, as well as his shortcomings, would not draw their meaning from a source beyond themselves, and man would not be a creature, but a demiurge of one kind or another. The history of the world would constitute a self-contained framework of meaning. On the contrary, even as the meaning of existence lies outside existence, and the dialectical relatedness implied by the polarity between cre creator and creature, so also the meaning of history lies above and beyond history. The creator of the world is also he who sustains it and gives it meaning. The origin of history is also its end. In the Judeo-Christian point of view, the concept of telos, i.e. 
of a divine purpose guiding the human and historical facts of coherence, as well as of incoherence, means just that. Under no circumstances does biblical thought reduce God to either an intellectual or a moral principle directly accessible to man within himself or without in nature and history, though he remain the God of man and of nature and of history. That is why in the thinking of biblical religion, God's primordial attribute, underlying or coinciding with his creatorhood, is his capacity to reveal himself. The creator God is at the same time he who reveals himself. God is not man, but the source of the reality of man. Between them there is an infinite qualitative difference. God is not in nature, he is the creator, the possibility of nature. His silence may be in nature, but not his speech. His hands and feet, perhaps, as Calvin said, but not his heart. And God is not in history, but is the beginning and the end of it. These views affect both the field of science and technology and the field of ethics, or existence as moral experience. And in the last century or so, both fields have systematically attempted to rid, rid themselves of theological postulates and assumptions. Their efforts have been crowned with success, but this success is not without its ironical side. It was Christianity which emancipated them from their supernaturalistic bondage by setting them upon a course of independent inquiry. What set them on this independent course was the Christian emphasis on the radical contingency of creation. One wonders at the fact that anything created is, that, rather than nothing at all, creation is. Therefore, to find out what it is, one looks to see rather than deducing the nature of the world from some principle or essences. The creation, which need not be, presumably could be otherwise than it is found empirically to be, without derogation upon the glory of the Creator. He had not to make the world, as Aristotle supposed, or history, as Spengler or Bergson or Toynbee suppose. It was hopefully assumed, and with reason, that this inquiry would naturally culminate in the creature's participation in the universal concert of God's glorification. Such a position is not without foundation, so long as one admits, as Christianity taught, that God is the possibility of scientific investigation as well as of nature, and that equally God is the possibility of human behavior and consequently of social experiences and of cultural achievements. The irony was materialized as soon as science and ethics or art, refuse to return the compliment. They indeed could be without the possibility of God. Modern humanism was thus born, with the primary aim of confining itself to the framework of the phenomenal world, since no noumenal world, if it exists, can be guaranteed other than through an act of surrender or through self-alienation. There arose in Western culture a scientific and anthropocentric humanism, which, even in terms of Christian premises concerning the reality of this world, has not only succeeded in formulating a coherent view of the universe, it has also succeeded in rendering Christianity vulnerable, precisely at the point where it would claim to be relevant to the condition of man, and especially of modern man. The Scientific Approach in the New Humanism Christianity, in keeping with biblical thought, could not equate God and nature, and therefore opposed all forms of nature worship as being essentially idolatrous. It confined itself to the transcendental, and it begot science as a method of investigation toward a descriptive understanding of nature in the universe. But Christianity was not always willing or ready to acknowledge, in fact, the position it was bound to assume in principle. Theology was granted the title of Queen of the Sciences, and a good deal of time was spent on assuring and promoting the hierarchical subordination of the other fields of knowledge. Sometimes, science suffered not so much from its theoretical subordination to the fields of spiritual concern as from a human tendency to confuse the goals of science with those of religion. This kind of error occurred time and again. Samuel Johnson, for example, rejoiced in his memoirs that simultaneously Barclay, Hutchinson, and the Abbe Pluck came to the conclusion that the teaching of the Bible conferred upon man the knowledge of a truly natural philosophy as well as the knowledge of the only true religion. Johnson was confusing the realms of natural phenomena and of spiritual reality. He was confusing empirical fact and a transcendental understanding of its meaning. 
his preconception about the inextinguishable light that the Bible can shed on human problems and aspirations was founded on a pious lie. Nevertheless, Christianity was instrumental in setting up the foundations of modern science and all that derives from it in the fields of technology, or even sociology and economics, and the independence it accorded to creation. There was an irreducible ambiguity in the classical attitude of Christianity vis-a-vis -vis science. This was a variant of the fundamental ambiguity that underlies all religiosity. Without this ambiguousness, religion could not appeal to those aspirations and the nature of man which are the highest. But the same aspirations, or rather their object, to paraphrase Lawrence Dorrell, often engage what is lowest in man. The basic ambiguity in the Christian conception of science consisted in the claim that science should fulfill itself in the glorification of God. Properly speaking, this glorification was the business of religion. Science was thus set free on a leash. Science was still subjugated to religion to evoke the glory of God from a universe which religion conceived as God's handiwork. Science was denied any authentic independent purpose so long as its raison d'etre was ancillary to the proper task of religion. But this is only the first layer of the ambiguity. There is a second. The subordination of science to religion reveals, by the ancillary role ascribed to science, the eminently religious conception that there can be no worldview other than a religious one. This is a reversal, perhaps unconscious, but a reversal nonetheless, of the original Christian conviction that faith in the transcendent creator and all conceptions of God as first cause or clockmaker are mutually exclusive. Christianity betrayed this principle as soon as it attempted to become a self-consistent worldview. It turned into a speculative theory about life and the universe and quite expectedly forced itself on other ways of human intelligence and especially on science. Ceasing to be the question addressed to all the questions and answers about the meaning of the universe, and now posed as an imperialistic answer, it claimed to possess the knowledge of good and evil, and like Adam, it fell. In its attitude vis-a-vis -vis science, Christianity became a mere system. Vulnerable as all systems are, it was bound to live but the life of a system. Soon it was challenged. Science which was allowed because it would aid the contemplation of God in the universe, now realized that this contemplation was purely incidental to its purpose and to its conquests. Christianity could have admitted this, were Christianity still abiding by the principle that God is not the missing link of a hypothesis. Logic impelled science to discard what it considered coincidental or incidental, just as the same logic impelled Christianity to try to keep science under its thumb. Science no longer sought to decipher God's intelligibility in the world. It simply sought henceforth to understand the world itself. Here, too, there is a tinge of irony. The purpose of science became precisely that which, under the auspices of Christianity, had enabled it to come into being, namely the proposition that since the world was God's creation, it was worth investigating and understanding. Science even rendered an unexpected service to Christianity. It disabled naturalism, or nature worship, and obliterated it in such a way that it can no longer raise its head. Christianity could have expected this from the science which it had engendered. But science did not do this in the name of the Christian God. It was by its nature indifferent to the particular type of religiosity it devalued. This devaluation was pure coincidence, and science was far from seeking it just as it realized that it was not less scientific for not seeking to take part in the concert of God's glorification. Meanwhile, however, the étante cordiale between Christianity and science was becoming a source of real conflict. The turning point occurred at the moment when the post-Christian era began. This turning point was brought about by science. It was not what science sought, but it soon became what science had brought to light. Its characteristic was that while science could neither prove nor disprove the existence of God, it attempted to explain the universe as a self-contained entity without necessarily having recourse to extraneous sources of meaning, such as God. In a parallel way, man was no longer seen as owing allegiance to God in order to understand himself. The religious mode of self-knowledge, although authentic, no longer constituted the only authentic avenue. At the same time, the feeling of dependence on an absolute became a luxury and a superfluity, 
since man's knowledge of the universe, though quite relative, still was more certain than his knowledge of any absolute. Before the turning point, man lived in an atmosphere where nature was conceived as being created by God. Now, however, nature is defined only in relation to man. Man himself replaces God and, by assuming responsibility for the universe in which he lives, he not only dismisses God, but also acts as a creator. When in the name of this new creator, science seeks to evoke a coherent and self-consistent worldview, it is actually questing for the knowledge of good and evil. It intends to correct nature and remake the creation in the name of man. At this point, science is no longer situated where at first it realized that God's hand in the universe, though perhaps a significant religious truth, is at best a superfluous bit of irrelevant conviction. It now constitutes itself as an alternative conception of the universe. It wills itself to be truly atheistic and humanistic. This does not merely negate the Christian view. It wills to assume responsibilities for the incoherence as well as the coherence of the universe and those of humanity, hoping to correct incoherence by a laborious and patient research into what meaning of the evidence it can glean. This atheism succeeds in invalidating what Christianity had called revelation, since the world is no longer regarded as God's handiwork, as the revelatory mirror of God's creative act. The elimination of the concept of creation entails the elimination of the concept of revelation, and furthermore, that of a revealed religion. Nonetheless, even if distantly, something seems to recall a religious worldview. This atheism is technological and truly Promethean for the first time. This comes from the fact that science, while it dethroned both natural and revealed religion, had also broadened its scope and snatched from religion its age-old handmaid, art. Technology is the irrepressible result of this new alliance between science and art. Perhaps no epithet better qualifies this post-Christian age than technological. But the rise of scientific or atheistic humanism is not due solely to these developments taking place in scientific thought. This rise was also prepared by developments occurring within Christianity, perhaps as a result of the impact of science. Christianity was not aware of this debilitating impact, even though there are many historical cases, from Galileo on, which it handled very poorly. It was not on the level of such spectacular aberrations, a blunder may become a redeeming factor, that Christianity was most in danger, but on another, less official level. The perilous moment was not a head-on collision between Christianity and science. The fatal blow came unexpectedly from a rather human and natural desire to unify science and religion under one pretext or another, and especially that of clinging to a religious view which had lost its relevance and was being superseded. By the end of the 19th century, write James H. Nichols, revivalism had largely washed out of the churches theological education, ordered worship, and sacramental practice, and the new theology and ethics drew to a marked degree on sources extraneous to the faith, especially on popular science. At the same time, attempts to reconcile religion and science were taking place on a higher level than that of popular religion and popular science. From Locke's The Reasonableness of Christianity, and Kant's Religion Within the Limits of Reason, and far beyond, into the beginning of the 20th century, one thought seems to have preoccupied many theologians and philosophers, that of accounting for the validity of Christianity in accordance with the scientific and progressivistic predilections of these times. Especially many a Christian thinker wanted to be not only a Christian, but also a modern man. From Friedrich Schleiermacher to Albrecht Ritschel, this became so predominant a concern that often the Christian was sacrificed to modern man, and Christianity accommodated to the cultural exigencies of the period. These theologians differed from their atheist contemporaries, but they differed even more seriously from their predecessors. From the perspective of classical Christian thought, the universe was a symbolic book pointing to God the Creator and Revealer, just as a cathedral is said to be a Bible in stone. Reason was not defined as conflicting with revelation, but was nonetheless endowed with a special privilege in its own sphere, independent of the sphere of faith. Between the terms of this duality, there stood the figure of Christ holding them distinct, but not separate, united, but not confused. By contrast, 
the theological constructions of the modern period give the impression that the universe is all the revelation there is of any god that may be, and that reason is but a more cogent and effective principle under which truth is grasped more adequately and less offendingly than under the principle of faith. In their legitimate effort to address the cultural despisers of religion, as Schleiermacher put it, these theologies reach the extreme of subsuming religion under the nascent scientific and technological culture. If 19th century theologians did not borrow directly from the highbrow science as revivalism did from popular science, they did attempt to placate it all they could and to render Christianity less mysterious, less demanding, less religious, and correspondingly more cultural. Richard Niebuhr's judgment about the cultural theologians of that century describes this attempt. Reason, they think, is the high road to the knowledge of God and salvation. Jesus Christ is for them the great teacher of rational truth and goodness, or the emergent genius in the history of religious and moral reason. Revelation, then, is either the fabulous clothing which intelligible truth presents itself to people who have a low IQ, or it is the religious name for that process which is essentially the growth of reason in history. Science was not alone in preparing the grounds for a self-reliant humanism. Christian theologians, too, were quite vocal in their attempts to show that Christianity was far from being adverse to it. A self-reliant universe and a no less self-reliant humanism became, for them, the highest manifestations of what formerly depended upon God's creative act and his redemptive purpose. All that was imminent and finite, yet susceptible to unlimited perfectibility, was naively regarded as the best incarnation of the transcendent and infinite. In the face of a world becoming self-contained and self-reliant, Christianity did not know quite what to do with a god who, more and more insufferably, had all the aspects of an intruder. Since Job, the roles had been reversed. The discoverers and conquerors of the world held a council, and God was propped up in their midst. But there was no Job. The Ethic of Radical Immanentism the inauguration of a post-Christian universe is to be imputed to the delinquency of Christianity rather than wholly to the arrogance of science or any other movement, materialistic or ideological, that Christians would like to construe as secularistic. Even if it intended to grapple with actual and not theoretically abstract problems confronting the concrete man of the 19th century, Christianity had intellectually misconducted itself and forfeited its relevance. For the sake of winning the world, it lost its soul. This constant dilemma of Christianity was never more desperately urgent than those who faced it with the embalmed corpse of the dead body of beliefs. Christianity had not altogether ruled out the possibility, let alone the necessity, of reconciliation between faith and God and man's not unnatural desire to find meaning in the universe and see it objectively confirmed. But traditionally, faith in God was itself the document confirming that there is meaning in the universe. In the modern period, Christianity began with the guileless but fatigued ascent to the seemingly evidential confirmation of the meaningfulness of the universe, and taking this as a document, hoped to have it at least countersigned by God. God became but an appendix to the marvels and wonders of a scientific universe. The car had been placed before the horse. And since then, those who still hold to the Christian faith have been trying to keep pace with the irresistible forces of a post-Christian era. Every age molds man according to its own image. The mark of this post-Christian age is that it has lost the power of contemplation so necessary to the Christian worldview. Its motto seems to be, that is scientific and accordingly humanistic, which, if it can be done, ought to be done, and if it ought to be done, can be done. The measure of all things, man claims for himself the privilege of being responsible for this world. But this he construes no longer in the sense in which Christianity understood man's responsible involvement in the world as a corollary to his commitment to God. His responsibility to this world is the only kind of commitment he knows and can justify. This justification follows the path of a reasoning which resembles the traditional Christian motif of a fallen universe needing God's redemptive action. But man himself is now assuming this divine prerogative. His responsibility toward the universe is to redeem it from the incoherent elements of which he claims himself innocent. This claiming of responsibility, 
LaCroix aptly remarks, is accompanied by a refusal to assume culpability. Contemporary atheism is largely a claiming of innocence, even as it is a vindication of humanism. It does not even bother to be anti-theistic, since it does not undertake the problem of reconciling the presence of evil and suffering with the justice and goodness of God. The cornerstone of this post-Christian age is not an attempt to fit evil into a coherent view of the universe, but to eliminate it from the universe. How else could man's dominion over nature and its elements be concretely manifested? Man now is what Christ, according to the New Testament, was to the world. He is the new redeemer, the meaning-giving center of this post-Christian era. In Toynbee's warning, the danger today is not a reemergence of nature worship, but the creeping religiosity of man-worship. Vincent van Gogh's burning desire, though quite susceptible to loftier aims, provides a zealous, if ambiguous, confirmation of this tendency to attribute to man what formerly was divine quality. I would, he said, paint men and women with that eternal je ne sais quoi of which a halo was once the symbol. Much less ambiguously, Sard and Camus picture man as the only one worthy of governing that which is his own kingdom anyway, especially now that God has been finally persuaded to give up his protracted re regency. Just as Sartre and Camus are aware that the solution of old problems, even pseudo-problems, only raises a new series of dilemmas, science and humanism do not consider that the major questions have been answered. No doubt with a certain amount of malice, Sartre said in his short essay on existentialism that the absence of God does not make things any easier. On the contrary, one can no longer appeal to an ultimate seed of judgment and mercy to complete and correct in a heavenly realm what has been left incomplete and uncorrected on this earth. Just as it was difficult ever to be sure of precisely what the will of God entailed, so it is equally difficult to determine which image of man is going to govern man's responsibility for this world. The atomic bomb and the repression of the Hungarian uprisings are revelations of one image even while the harnessing of the atom and the artificial satellites reflect another image. The will of man may be even more difficult to fathom, fathom than the will of God. Modern man is in at least one respect as helpless and disoriented as Mary Magdalene, who stood weeping outside Jesus' apparently empty tomb because they have taken away my Lord. The drive toward logical consistency has not, despite the success of its logic in eliminating God, achieved consistency where it matters most. No longer in need of God, modern man still needs to find himself. He is back where he started from. Previously, his quest was undertaken under theistic auspices. It is now undertaken under post-Christian and sometimes atheistic auspices. The directions are no longer the same. They are no longer transcendental, but purely immanental. Their meaning does not depend on a beginning in the action of a creator god, nor does it depend on the end fulfilled by a divine intervention. It is neither at the foot nor at the top of Sisyphus's mountain. It is in the rock subordination to Sisyphus. In the name of the kingdom of God, Christianity negates any self-sufficient order cozily established in a self-reliant universe. But in the name of man, post-Christian thought denies the moral and spiritual certitudes invested in a kingdom of God and refuses them the task of ameliorating the deficient order evolved from an unreliable universe. This post-Christian ethic presents characteristics analogous to the Christian. Like the Christian, it is primarily an ethic of solidarity. But here the solidarity is achieved only if God is excluded, for instead of cementing it, he would betray it. Kant notwithstanding, God has become superfluous to a postulate authenticating moral action. This ethic is thoroughly anthropocentric. It perhaps agrees with the Christian tradition about the universality of the law of nature, but unlike the Christian tradition, it does not regard the natural law as a prop for a theologically oriented ethic. Instead of considering the law of nature as implying the divine law, it regards that implication as a usurpation of the human order in favor of a divine order at best improbable and irrelevant. The post-Christian ethic here diverges from the Christian to the point of opposing it radically. In the Christian view, Adam's fall simultaneously precipitated the corruption of the whole world. The solidarity of mankind on this account is a corollary of its common sinfulness. Responsibility surges from the realization of guilt and its forgiveness by a divine intervention. 
By contrast, the post-Christian ethic establishes solidarity on the basis of man's innocence of the absurdity of the world. The great difference lies in this. The Christian ethic is an ethic of forgiveness. The post-Christian is an ethic of innocence. Because in each case, responsibility is the essential cornerstone, the post-Christian ethic cannot be lightly dismissed on the pretext that it is merely a secularization, an amputated and negative version of the Christian. If anything, it does not propose to be easier than the Christian ethic. Neither optimistic nor self-complacent, it constitutes a serious challenge to the Christian view and a more authentic choice in the desacralized universe. Jean-Paul Sartre's play, The Flies, describes the present post-Christian situation as providing man with the only condition relevant to an authentic apprehension of his existence and his destiny. This situation is both a result of the Christian tradition and its ultimate negation. Modern man has been so fashioned by Christianity that he can only reject it in order to be himself. Jupiter, I am not your king, impudent worm. Who then has created you? Orestes, you, but you should not have created me free. Jupiter, I gave you freedom in order to serve me. Orestes, this may be so, but it turned against you, and neither you nor I can do anything about it, nor am I excusing myself for this. Orestes further explains his attitude by declaring that Jupiter may be the king of gods, as well as the king of stones and the stars, and the king of the waves and the sea, but he is not the king of man. So far as modern man is concerned, Christianity may be the only or the best religion, but it is not his religion. He will not forsake the world in order to find the meaning of the only existence to which he is bound, as he is to this world. And by forsaking Christianity, he finds that this world contains at least one meaning, that of human existence. The life of a religion is to be measured by the efficacy of its symbols. A symbol, though it has an authenticity of its own, and therefore imposes itself, yet may die. So also a religion. The symbols of Christianity are all theocentric, as were the culture and the humanism they fostered. It is difficult to make them relevant to a milieu like the present one, which is impregnated by an atheistic and anthropocentric humanism. Even where religiosity survives, there also the concern is centered on man. But the pre prevalent anthropocentrism of today does not signify that men are now more egotistical than their ancestors. Selfishness has always been equally and profusely distributed to all men in all ages. A man may believe in God for purely selfish reasons, often eloquently externalized as the fear of hell. That kind of selfishness at least has lost its appeal now that hell has become a questionable reality. Or rather, now that man is his own redeemer. The clear meaning of the present anthropocentrism is this. The improbability of God is a practical fact. It is an everyday reality available to the experience of all existing beings. This, then, is the force of the ineluctable anthropocentric categories by which this age understands its situation. The death of God is not an intellectual cry of merely iconoclastic value, nor was God's presence ever a matter of purely intellectual assertion or demonstration. As such, it meant little, unless it was translated into concrete realities and concern. But God's absence, or the death of God itself, has become what a man directly experiences. It is no longer a theoretical declaration. It is a practical awareness by which authentic existence often is measured. The classical Christian who believed in God and lived accordingly was often incapable of intellectually arguing the existence of God. And certainly, he did not have to demonstrate it with arguments and counterarguments. But this did not invalidate the reality of God it was no less relevant to a man's concrete situation. What today's anthropocentrism expresses is the irrelevance of God, be he real or just an idea, to concrete existence. God is dead, not in sheer intellectual scaffoldings, but in the down-to-earth give and take of the human condition. The era of God's death may be only a transition. New social structures and cultural forces may pick up what Western culture has now deserted, through the Pilgrim Fathers, America picked up and re-enlivened the spirit of utopian and radical Christian adventurousness, 
when a disintegrating Christendom was torn by religious, economic, and nationalist strifes. The pilgrims infused the spirit into a commonwealth, which was all the more majestic because it implied a radical rupture with the past and a bold new beginning. Something of the sort is still theoretically conceivable. It seems, though, that such a recurrence is a matter of faith and hope, rather than of an objective diagnosis. For in the present context, Christianity has no strong foothold. It seems to have fulfilled its role and reached the point of obsolescence. Life is replete with such built-in obsolescent devices. They are discarded once they have accomplished their usefulness. And again, the result is a radically imminentist conception of life. If anything characterizes the modern temper, it is a radical imminentism. This imminentism is significant because scientifically and culturally, as well as theologically, it is impossible to identify God as prime mover or universal sustainer of the world of phenomena. Ethically, this imminentism prohibits reliance on any ready-made codes, whose enforcement depends on inquisitorial procedures or on obscurantist theologies. Consequently, it means going beyond the temporal and temporary realizations Christianity has bequeathed to the contemporary world. Irony reaches its climax when even the Christian discovers that his God really is not the foundation stone on all that he had been accustomed to regarding as an integral part of a culture he termed Christian. The same Christian is then in the position where he must at least grant validity to the counter choices proposed by a thoroughly imminental humanism. If the contemporary human predicament is not necessarily as the humanists and atheists describe it, the Christian view is even less self-evident and, in fact, its relevance is even more hypothetical. Thus, at the present juncture, the least that a Christian can and must do is to acknowledge the dichotomy, even antinomy, between the Christian ideal and the assumptions which gird the spirit of this de-Christianized world. Such an acknowledgement, minimal though it is, warrants the assertion that the post-Christian era has dawned. <laughs>